Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session. Uh, this is my friend, Professor Dr. Valerie Bon Jensen. Uh, she's the chair of the education department at St. Michael's College, and she's an expert in children's literature and literacy in general. This is my dear friend and colleague, Mark Luckwitz, who is the chair and a professor in the biology department at St. Michael's College, and his background is that of a molecular biologist. Now, some may be wondering, what is an electrobiologist and a literacy person doing collaborating? And that is going to be part of our story today. And before we really launch into it, we do want to give one disclaimer. We are not trying to replace uh, scientific practice or science time. What we're going to show you today is how you can use children's literature to support and to help develop that mindset of thinking like a scientist. And of course, what we're going to really convince you of is that the mindset that scientists have, the seven cross-cutting concepts, is doesn't, isn't really the domain of scientists in general. It's actually how all humans think. And uh, you see it in children's literature every day. All right, so we're gonna give you a backstory, how we ended up working together, then what it means to think and read like a scientist using the cross-cutting concepts. And then we'll launch into some children's literature and illustrate how that, can, how that works. So Valerie, you wanna you want tell a story of how uh, we ended up working together? Sure. sure, so I was just realizing that 20 years ago in August, Mark and I started at St. Michael's on the same day. And at that time, I would have never guessed that we would end up writing books together and thinking deeply about the intersections of science and literature. So it's really great to be here and be celebrating that collaboration. So when the, cross when the Common Core Standards came out and insisted that children and teachers be working more with nonfiction, I was teaching a graduate course on nonfiction in the elementary grades. And one of the things I wanted us all to think about is how our own expertise and experience shapes and colors the way that we read and the way that we think. And so I invited a scientist to my class. I said, and of course, I said, class. Valerie, what do I need to do to get ready for your class? And I just said, just come, because that was the whole point, was that the way that he thinks about things would become apparent in his response. So I read this beautiful picture book, Winter Barn, aloud to my class of practicing teachers, in-service teachers, and I invited them at the end to share their response. And because they are great thinkers and readers, they noticed how the sparse text went beautifully with the mood of the illustrations it was almost poetic. They noticed the specialized vocabulary, tier three vocabulary, when the author used mortises and tenons to describe the way that the, the foundation was, or, or the barn was created. And they also noticed reference to historical facts about Hessian soldiers who helped build it. And then I turned to Mark and I said, Mark, what did you notice? And I said, I didn't hear any of that. What I heard was a horror story. And, and of course, the reason that I framed it as a horror story is because I had sorted all the animals into two categories, either predators or prey. And I knew that over the scale of the winter, the predators were going to eat the prey. So I had a very take on, a very different take on, on, the, um, on the book. And of course, that was the reason Valerie invited me to the class was to see how the way we're educated, our lens shapes the way we see everything, inc including a book like Winter Barn. Now, if you were to ask yourself, or let me back up a second, you could say at that moment, what I was doing was I was listening and thinking like a scientist. So that gets us to the question, what does it mean to think like a scientist? And, and to be a scientist, I, I would argue there's like sort of three, three things, right? There's content, um, discipline specific ideas, there's the um, process, like how do you answer questions as a scientist? And then there's the mindset. The, the thing that all scientists share, whether you're a goat researcher, a molecular biologist, or a meteorologist, and that's been described by NGSS as cross-cutting concepts. All right, so let's look at how the cross-cutting concepts, how all seven of them can be found just in the cover of Winter Barn to see how I landed up on that position so many years ago, 20 years ago, it turns out, I've forgotten that. So if you look just at the, uh, at the cover, the illustration, um, what it tells me is the pattern is winter, okay? And I know that that pattern is going to cause the farmer to move the animals inside of this structure, whose function it is to shelter and protect the animals. I know that I can view this structure um, as a system uh, in and of itself, so it's got uh, defined boundaries and interacting components within it, or I could view it as, view it as a system model, 
use it as a model for, let's say, the entire ecosystems of New England. Um, I know that energy and matter flow into that system and that energy and matter fuel cause and effect relationships, which become the pattern that defines that system. So for example, every day the farmer may bring in food and water and take away waste. That's a, a pattern that drives cause and effect relationships that defines that system. And then I know that I can look at that system as either being stable or changing depending upon the scale. So I know that if I look at it over the whole course of the wintertime, there's a rhythm. There's food and water come in every day, waste gets taken out, it's usually at dawn and dusk. So there's a very defined pattern on that time scale. If I change the time scale and I zoom into that exact moment when the mouse, actually the mouse is eating the cat, that exact moment when a cat eats the mouse, I could say that that system, particularly the mouse, is changing. So that's what it means to think and to listen or to read like a scientist, to take these seven cross-cutting concepts and apply it even just to the cover of Winter Barn. So we were totally blown away, but all of us have the same reaction. We want what he has. We want to think about this the way that Mark was thinking. And we thought, could we develop these habits of mind? And so Mark and I started talking about this. And what we realized was that actually all of the cross-cutting concepts are also literary devices. And we're going to try to help you see that. It's kind of just asking you to do a little bit of code switching. So, for example, if you look at pattern and what that looks like in literature, you know, a fable has a pattern. We know there's always going to be a lesson or a moral at the end. And science fiction always imagines what if something is happening. And then cause and effect is just another way of saying plot. Have you ever read a book where nothing happens? Actually, I think I have, but rare. <laughs> plot and cause and effect are synonymous. And structure and function, just when writers go about writing, they organize their ideas into a way that will help the reader understand. That's the function. And we can even see in picture books, physical structures of books where fold out or gate, gatefold pages make a page even longer than it might have been. And then if you think about um, systems and system models, so the setting of, of your favorite novel is really just the boundary of the system. And the characters are the interacting components. And, it, and your favorite novel could be even a model. For example, let's take Watership Down. Was it really about rabbits or was it about society? Yeah, or Animal Farm, right? Yeah. So scale, that's another decision a writer has to, um, to make. And readers have to figure out, is this a day in the life of? Is this a walk that Peter takes in the snowy day for 20 minutes? Is this about an intergenerational family saga, or is it about society? So what is the scale um, that's take, that is, is used in this book? And just like in Winter Barn, energy and matter flows into a system and it fuels cause and effect relationships. And if you think about how you cause and effect relationships, how you drive the plot, um, it's by either introducing and taking away characters, having those characters do something or putting an event in like a hurricane or a pandemic. And so one of the things that Mark has helped me realize too is that most books use the idea of change and stability to build their plot around. So for example, if you have um, a book about a character and everything's going swimmingly and then new energy and matter comes into their life and they're thrown into change, that's a way that change and stability are used as plot points or plot structures, or you could have a book that opens in the middle of a flood and the rest of the book is about how that community regains stability. And as readers, we've even come to expect this, right? So imagine we've all experienced this where you're reading a book and then it just ends and it's not resolved, which is another way of saying the pattern wasn't brought, brought back into stability. And we even see this in TV series. Aren't we all still wondering and feel a little bit disappointed in The Sopranos? <laughs> yeah, what did happen? Anyway, know. what does this look like um, in picture books? So let's take an example that most of you are probably familiar with and just focus on pattern. So probably you're looking at that and right away you recognize the pattern of uh, Eric Carle's signature work. He does collages. And if you know this book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? You start to see the pattern of how the book unfolds. A colorful animal sees another one who sees another one. And there's even, a, the language is in a pattern. Purple cat, purple cat, what do you see? I see a yellow duck looking at me. And so forth, until the pattern is disrupted at the end where they see a teacher. 
And you can see pattern and stability and change being used even in YA and adult um, literature as well. So if you take the Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, as we're all aware, what happens is at some time frequency, a group of kids are gotten together, thrown into this diabolical arena, and you have one ultimate winner. And then the, the fulcrum that, that sort of disrupts society is when Peta and Katniss decide they're, they're not going to allow just one ultimate winner. They're going to break that pattern and throw their society into change. Yeah, so we have to get the pattern in order to be surprised or satisfied when it's broken. Um, so sometimes we can see many of the cross-cutting concepts appear in picture books. If you know this powerful book by Jackie Woodson called Each Kindness, you'll know that the system here is a third grade. There's a teacher, there's a, a set of students, and they're in a kind of stability where they're all interacting and certain kids play together. And then boom, new energy and matter enter the system in the form of Maya, a new student. And it throws all the cliques and relationships into change. And some really tough cause and effect actions occur because of that. So you can see that we, we might call them climax, we might call them plot, but really all of these ones that we've described um, are about cross-cutting concepts and literary devices. So one of the things Mark said earlier is that we, we know that you're working with inquiry science and all kinds of great experiments, but we know that science gets shortchanged in schedules in elementary classrooms. And so we just thought, why not use read alouds as a way to um, help launch these ideas into the classroom discussions? And then the ultimate goal here is really to empower our students to, to read and think like a scientist that by cross-cutting concepts. So the idea isn't, you know, Valerie and I had this, uh, this realization a couple of years ago. It's not that scientists are smarter than other people. The reason they appear to be able to assimilate content so quickly is because they know how to slot it. The cross-cutting concepts is a framework, a schema, a, a, a map for how to get to information and explore any new content. So by reinforcing it through children's literature, we're building the habits of minds that will make them better readers, better writers, and better thinkers as scientists. So at this point, you may be wondering, so if this is true, what type of books might this appear in? And the good news is that it, it appears, as far as we can tell, in all books. And we've, we've put, it, we put all books that have this cross-cutting concept, which is all books, into two categories. So they are shout books. Shout books, as we like to say, are about the cross-cutting concept. So if you take a tree like, if you take a, sorry, if you take a book like Tell Me Tree by Gail Gibbons, this is a book about systems. It's about the patterns and the energy and matter that flows into trees, right? So that's, it's an about book. It's shouting the cross-cutting concepts. Yeah, and we've noticed that most of the time nonfiction books, because they're about something, shout the various concepts. But you can find these concepts in any work of fiction as well. For example, uh, The Snowy Day, there's Peter, he's out for his walk. This book is just about his, him taking a walk on a snowy day. It doesn't shout anything about concepts. But it's so clear, if you look at the cover, he's really interested in cause and effect. He's taking a walk in the snow and he's turning around and there are footprints. And I could also talk about pattern. There is a street light. I know one when I see one because it looks like all the other ones. And there's even cause and effect involved with street lights, we all know what happens or what should happen when it turns red. Valerie, you love quick start questions, I know. Yeah, I do. You know, when I get a new device, I don't want to read all the details. I just want to know what, what are the quick start questions that are going to get me right to it. And I'll tell you, I did, I did not take many science classes. And I knew that to learn the cross-cutting concepts was going to need some quick start questions. So Mark and I have come up with some quick start questions to help you get at discussions with your students pretty quickly. So for example, for pattern, one of them is, what is this? So Mark, what is this? Uh, I think it's a house. So how do you know a house when you see one? Well, let's see, the house pattern is it's gonna have a door, some walls, a roof that's at about that angle. And this one has windows and chimneys, chimney. Yeah, yeah, so to identify a pattern, you just look for what repeats. So I think he's got it in terms of the house. And so Valerie, let's look, um, let's look at the chimney if we can. So uh, to get at cause and effect, we just need to ask what's happening and 
Um, well, let's start with what's happening. What's happening in the chimney? Now? Yeah, I see smoke coming out of the chimney. So what will always get you to the effect? Now let's get to the cause. Why is it happening? Yeah, I'm pretty sure somebody built a fire in that fireplace. Now, if we wanted to go a little bit deeper to, to get to the cause of the cause, we call the mechanism, you just ask how. So how is it happening? That would be the mechanism. Yeah, that's that may be, I may need to study that a little bit more, but I think there's some kind of chemical reaction when you light the fire, when you light the newspaper that then lights the wood. Yes, what, why, how, though, is all you need to get the cause and effect there. Yeah, the quick starts. So this quick start questions for structure and function. Uh, so Valerie, what does that chimney do? What's this function? Yeah, I think that it draws the smoke away from the fire and out of the house. Okay, and what's the shape of the, uh, of the chimney? Yeah, it's tall, it's definitely hollow, and it extends beyond the roof of the house. All right, and how would you describe the physical properties? Um, they're soft. Pretty or short. Soft. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're solid and brick. I've yeah. seen some pipes too. And definitely not paper mache. Right. <laughs> and okay, so if we were going to continue with this, we would then follow up with how do those two those two categories of shape and physical properties enable the function? Okay, and scale. I love this one. So. We've been assuming that the house that Mark identified at the beginning was a house that he could live in or I could live in. And the quick start question here is to pick a familiar object. So I'm picking the house as this house where any of us could live. Then what does that tell us about the foot, Mark? If that's my house, then I'm very scared because there's a giant above me. It's a giant. That's right. But if I pick the foot as a familiar object and just said, Mark, it's your foot, what does that tell you about the house? Well, if that's my foot, then I know it's a dollhouse because the reference is my foot. Right. So once you pick your reference point, you can ask like Goldilocks did, is it, is it big, is it little, or is it in the middle? And that will help you understand scale. Now, to get a to get a system of system boundaries, uh, system of system models, you you always want to first um, identify the boundaries of the system. So, Valerie, how do you know where a house begins and ends? Begins and ends. Yeah. So, in this case, I would say it's the walls of the house, the roof line, the edges of the chimney, and everything inside. And how about what are the interacting components that make up the house? Um, I would say, you know, all the things in it, the floors, the ceilings, the furniture, the HVAC systems. The goldfish in the tank. <laughs> the people. <laughs> all right. And then how could we, uh, well, we can use a model to ask what if. So let's do a what if. Since we had a fire in our house earlier in the fireplace, what if we got rid of the chimney? Yeah. The, so I think if we model that, we would see that we would probably lose our house pretty fast. Um, yes. I think architects use blueprint. That's another way, that's a form of a model to ask those kinds of questions. Yeah, and you would never fly in an airplane that had not been modeled. That's right. <laughs> All right, to get an energy and matter. Um, so what's the system doing, Valerie? Uh, yeah, so the house is just there functioning like a house does with the systems humming. And then what would happen if we were to fast forward, let's say half a second, where that foot goes careening into that system. So what's the fuel? Well, first of all, what would be happening then? Yeah, it would, it would be smashed by the foot. So I would say the foot in motion is causing something to happen. And then would you say that that house is transformed or is it the same? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it would be in smithereens, right? Yeah. Okay. And so if we, if we, um, if we go, rerun that in our minds. Did something happen to the house once the once the foot smashed it, Mark? Uh, yes, but before something, before it got smashed, nothing was happening. But when the foot hit that house, yes, that house was changing. Okay, so before it was just humming along with all the systems doing something. And then once it, once it got stepped on, definitely the boundary switch, switch the interacting components are smashed. Um, and but then if, that, if, we waited, if, if we waited long enough, then we had all those pieces on the floor, we'd reach a new dynamic equilibrium. It'd be, it'd be stable, but it'd be different. Yeah. So once I learned about the, se the seven different ones, we developed some questions that would help me. I, I used them as a tool. I started to realize, and here's a, a chart we would have given you um, had we seen you in person, but 
even though it looks complicated and there looks like there's seven houses, actually these seven different concepts just help us understand the same house or the same system. So getting back to books, how do we apply this then to books? We kind of did it with a picture of a house. And when we look at books, what we notice is that the cross-cutting concepts shout and whisper in illustrations and in language. And so if we just first look at illustrations in these two book covers, this one on the left is Kate and the Beanstalk. And if we choose Kate as our familiar reference point, she's our size. And then we look down at the fields below, we realize she is way high up because they are so small. And if you look at the, uh, the book called Hurricane by Gail Gibbons, if you look at the language, so notice that hurricane is all in caps. It's got an exclamation point and it's in red, sort of the, the danger color, all of which is shouting to you energy and matter as well as uh, system and change. And then if you look at an illustration with an up down, upside down school bus and a roof coming off, that also uh, shouts energy and matter and systems and change, disrupting patterns. So let's look, let's, let's look at an actual illustration from a children's literature book. This is a double page spread um, called Owl Moon. And if you're not familiar with the book, it's a Caldecott award winning book. And it's about a <laughs> and daughter that are in New England and they go out at night in the snow and make their hoo 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 sound to try to uh, attract barred owls. So um, we always like to say that the illustrator puts the, the system that you should focus on front and center. So, Valerie, what, what would you say is the defining system in this picture? Yeah, so since it goes across the double, double page spread, as you noted, I would say it's the owl. All right, and so let's start off with pattern. How do you know an owl when you see one? How did you know this was an owl? What yeah, you know, it has those little things that I think of as ears, and it's got the strong talons, and just the shape of its wings, I would say, help me. It's the owl pattern. And then remember, to get to cause and effect, you just need what and why. So what's happening? I think it's landing, it's slowing itself down, it's getting its talons ready. And then the why is it landing, we'd actually have to read the book, but it's because the father and daughter. <laughs> now let's go to structure, and so much structure and function, but I think I like the talons. So uh, Valerie, what's the purpose of the talons? Yeah, I think that one purpose might be to capture prey, but I think in this illustration, I'm guessing that they're gonna help the owl grip the um, limb so it can land. And uh, so, so you just um, alluded to the shape a little bit. Let's talk about the physical properties. How would you describe those talons? Yeah, I think the talons are hard and, and pointy, um, sharp, and uh, the rest of the foot is flexible, so it can curve. And uh, since we already sort of mentioned system, let's jump to energy and matter. What, uh, where do you see energy and matter in this out? So what's happening? Yeah, so it's landing, so I feel like it's motion, energy in motion, and it's kind of maneuvering its wings to slow it down. But I right. bet it ate a mouse this morning. The power yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the fuel for our biological systems is always food, and, and probably this year chipmunks for if you live where we live, overabundance. Um, and let's get to uh, stability. Did you say that the owl is stable or changing, or might it depend on scale somehow? Yeah, I'm gonna go with your last little hint and say it's probably both. Yeah, so so Valerie, what does an owl do every night, all night long? Yeah, it's it's hunting. It's a nocturnal creature and it, it probably lands and takes off and dives and land all night long. Yeah, so on the scale of the entire night, taking off and landing, taking off and landing, taking off and landing is an expected pattern. So we would say that's stable. But if we zoom in to this exact moment where the owl is landing, is flying, and then it's not, you would say it is? Change, it's changing. It's changing because we changed the scale. Right. Um, all right, so we just took a little bit of a detour there to show how the concepts show up in illustrations, and now we're gonna just have you have a, have a glimpse at how we see it appearing in language. And I was thinking the other day, Mark and I are both chairs of our departments right now, and I called them up and I said, can I vent? And I said, don't transfer your negative energy to this positive system. Right. So, so really, the cross-cutting concepts appear in our language all the time. And we thought it would be fun to share with you some examples um, with words that hint at changing systems. 
So a few years ago, my daughter had a baby and I flew out to Seattle and my sleep deprived son-in-law picked me up and I said, so how's it going? And he said, tough evening, but now we are back on track. So not only was their family system changing, but he was following the, his sleep patterns at night. And even common words like emergency. So if I told you, if I told you that I had to go to the emergency room last night, you would say something endearing like, I hope you feel better, which is really another way of saying, I know that your system was in change and I hope it's back to, to steady state equilibrium. So we're hearing this a lot lately. There's um, a big movement going on, a big anti-racism movement in our country. There's also a global pandemic. And I think both will be called historical moments. Um, and that means that our society and our world um, might be sort of in dynamic equilibrium or kind of stability, but right now we're experiencing a moment of change. And I just want things to be normal is another way of saying my system has changed and I want it to go back to the old stability. So if you're teaching in your classroom and you're meeting with a guided reading group and all of a sudden there's a table upended at the back of the room and you say you're in trouble, what you really are saying is our stability just got thrown into change. And even a word like flood whispers, um, too much energy and matter coming into, into a system, whether it be a toilet, a river, or a flood of ideas, but it's throwing the system into change. So it appears in illustrations and in language. And so to pull everything together, we um, are sharing an illustration from a Caldecott award-winning book by Kathleen Krull called, Wil called Wilma Unlimited. And this illustration by David Diaz is taken um, from the end of the book where Wilma, um, an Olympic medalist who overcame polio, is running a big race. And as always, we, we like to start off with looking at illustration with the author puts front and center. So um, we think it's either Wilma or the runners. And so, and I just keep saying it, runners. So Valerie, how do you know that Wilma's a runner? Yeah, so I think her stance or her pose looks like she's in motion and running and the way that she's dressed and she's wearing special shoes and it looks like a track. And I then think cause and effect, what and why. So what is she doing? She's running and I, I bet that the, the starter pistol went off. Yes, you wanna do structure function? Sure, um, I love those, to look at those little uh, starters blocks on the track and think about how they must be fairly firm so she can push off, so that's the physical property. And the triangular shape is also a way to propel her more than if they were flat. And I also love looking at the tripods and imagining with those heavy cameras from the 60s whether they would stand up if, if it were um, just two legs instead of three. And so many systems here. Um, why don't you pick a system, Valerie, and uh, uh, what, what's the boundary and the interacting components? Yeah, so we could look at Wilma and her body and um, the interactive components, all the, all the systems of a, of a healthy body that work together. Um, and, uh, you know, we could look at the, the cameras and all the parts of that system, the boundary being the tripod and the, the camera itself and all the intricate mechanisms. Now, I, know, of it. I know you love scale. Do you want to do scale? I love scale. I love thinking, wow, is this a crowd here at this Olympic event? Because if I use Wilma as my reference point and I look in the distance, there's so many little heads. I know it's a big crowd. Yeah. And then energy and matter. So for biological systems, the, you know, the energy is always going to be a food system. But where do you see energy coming out of Wilma? Yeah. So I think the motion, you know, really intense motion. Yeah. And, and I bet had a really good breakfast. And then, then stability and change is Wilma, well, let, me, let me phrase the question accurately. Um, on what scale is Wilma changing and on what scale is Wilma stable? Yeah, so I think the changing, we just heard the starter's pistol. And so I feel like she went from a standstill, like zero miles per hour to pretty darn fast. So I would say in that, you know, second, she, her system experienced really rapid change. But I bet that she's been preparing for this and running races day in, day out, week in, week out, over a number of years. So it's kind of, she's kind of stable. That's what runners do. 
And then if we, if we leave just the science world for a second, we can think about stability and change in some other contexts, particularly in the social sciences. So Wilma was an African-American woman in the civil rights era at the Olympics. She was a polio survivor and um, a medalist. And so in about 11 seconds, the world is gonna be very different because of her. Right. So we can also, we can also look at the text here or the words like Mark and I did with, um, with stability and change and think about ears buzzed, for example. To me, that really shouts cause and effect um, or structure and function. Let's think about structure and function. The way that her ears are made with the little hairs that buzz with vibrations. Um, so that, that's a really good example of that concept in some text. What about you, Mark? Do you see one? I, you, know, I, you know me, I love energy and matter. So buzzed and chanting just whisper energy and matter to me, really energy. Yeah. And I think one thing you always tell me is that any noun is a pattern. So ears, how do we know what an ear when we see one? It has all those things that repeat. That's, that's a pattern. Crowd. We know a crowd has a lot of people in it. We know a crowd when we see one because of that. Yes. One so, of the go, go ahead. So, so um, when we were writing one of our books, Valerie and I were visiting a third grade classroom uh, with, by the, the teacher's name is Callie Lumbra. And uh, we visited one day after lunch during Read Aloud and the Read Aloud was Charlotte's Web. And Valerie's going to share with you now what we observed. And what I want you to listen for is how the cross-cutting concepts appear in the dialogue among the students. Yeah, so Callie was reading the classic, Charlotte's Web. And spoiler alert, she's going to read the part where Charlotte decides how she can save her friend Wilbur by writing some letters in her web. So this is what she read. A spider can produce several kinds of thread. She uses a dry, tough thread for her foundation lines, and she uses a sticky thread for snare lines, the ones that catch and hold insects. Charlotte decided to use her dry thread for writing the new message. At this point, while we were observing, Wiley sat up and raised his hand, and he said, I know why she had to use the dry thread. And when her teacher asked him why, he said, a sticky thread would catch insects. And another student sat up and said, right, and that would mess up the words. So Callie leaned into this conversation and gave them the labels that they were talking about and said, right, she chose a certain structure for her function to work. And what Mark and Callie and I realized afterwards in talking is that Callie hadn't planned to talk about the concepts during this read aloud, but because she had been reading picture books and discussing the concepts that occurred in them using the quick start questions, the students had started to listen and read and write like scientists. So I think we're, we're almost out of time now, but um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. And uh, if you're interested, you know, um, invite us for a workshop, come visit us on campus when that's, when that's allowed again. And uh, thank you for attending. Thank you.